Hey, this is Latif Mikado, and you're listening to the Good Night Freestyle Podcast, where I take some time each night to try and reflect on the freestyle scene, where it is, where it's going, and try to figure out how to sustain it, not just for future generations to enjoy, but also to benefit. So sit back, relax, and let's talk some freestyle. Hey, what's up, everybody? I am back. Um, episode 13, Good Night Freestyle. Thank you so much, everyone who's tuning in tonight. Um, yesterday, I got a really good response from uh, yesterday's episode. To be honest, um, I thought maybe I was getting a little too personal, but I'm getting like a lot of love for it. Um, I know it's called Good Night Freestyle. Maybe even in the trailer, I talk about how I want to talk more about freestyle. But in actuality, it really wasn't my initial intentions. My initial intentions was just to have a time to unwind, um, to talk about things that affect me or things that may affect the people around me. Um, Sometimes that might have to do with freestyle. Sometimes not, Um, but uh, no matter what, uh, this is what I do, this is what I do for a living, so I've done for, uh, God, the last 30 years, (laughs) so I'm pretty um, engulfed in it, Um, but anyway, yeah, so yesterday, you know, I talked about my trip to Puerto Rico growing up traveling with my mom and and uh yeah it was it was pretty it was it was pretty funny it has some little highlights there so but everybody who who checked it out man I really appreciate it it really means a lot to me um um I'm I'm just I'm not stepping to this mic with any kind of scripts or any bullet points so even an idea of what I want to talk about I'm serious man I have no idea I just figured once I hit record and I start talking that something will come out. I'm just hoping it's the right thing. <laughs> but um, we, before I go any further, um, I had a question that was uh, sent to me via messenger um, by one of our listeners. And um, he says, Latif, can a booking agent book artists? that's under contract with another booking agent? And if so, can that booking agent charge him to book the artist? Hmm, okay, wait up. <laughs> let me read this again. All right, hold on. Okay, can a booking agent book an artist? Okay, that's under contract with another agent. Okay, so for instance, if somebody's signed to me, they're under contract, can another agent contact them? And if so, can that booking agent charge him to book the artist? Well, technically, he could. <laughs> he could. Um, uh, if I have an act that's exclusive with me and another audit, another agent comes to me and says, you know, I'm trying to get this, this artist, I mean, I could charge him outright or I can just tell him to work the numbers. So normally how it goes so for those who don't know I am a booking agent that is my primary bread and butter that's where the bulk of my income comes from that's what I've done the most that's what's given me the most connections and putting me really really deep into this genre is through bookings yes I manage little Susie I manage the original cover girls I've had other acts in the past too much I don't really try to go that wide When it comes to managing, it is a lot of work, especially if your acts are popular, if they're busy. So it can be, it can be, you know, um, I like to be on the road and both my acts like for me to be on the road. So I have to juggle that as well. Um, That's why a lot of times you'll see the cover girls and little Susie together on one gig. So back to the question. All right. Let's use, let's use little Susie as an example. So. Little Susie is X amount of money to book. 
plus her expenses, okay? So let's say the Joe Blow agency contacts me and they want to book her. So when I book her or any other artist, I get a commission. I get a percentage of what I booked them for. Most acts have a set fee, so it's not like because we get a, a commission that we will charge more. That It doesn't work that way because we don't want that to get back to the promoters. If the promoters start shopping around and they see that, you know, I'm this high-priced agent, not only will I lose that gig, I'll probably lose the relationship with that promoter and I'll probably get a bad reputation. So we don't want to do that. In fact, I try to get the promoters the best price possible, okay? Because many of the artists do fluctuate on their price, okay? Even if I get them at a certain price, there's a good chance that somebody's gotten them a little lower and some people have gotten them a little higher. So I kind of try to play with that. I don't want to cheat the artists either. There are artists that, you know, they come in at a certain price and I think it's perfect. I have not come across an artist yet that I think was being undervalued. I, that has not happened, you know. Um, so <clears throat> let's say for little Susie, they come to me and they say, now they have their own client, their own promoters that they're selling the act to. So they come to me and they'll say, Latif, we need Susie. I said, no problem. There's two ways I can do it. They can either send me the account and I can adjust since they're my, if it's my personal artist that I manage, I can adjust the fee with their fee added in. So it's not like we're getting one commission. We have to split that. That's a very normal way of doing it. The other way is adding on top. So if the artist is $10, let me go with a low weird number, $10, then the other people can charge $15 for the gig, okay? They could charge them, so that way they're going to walk away with their $5, all right? Um, they can give me that, and in the contract, I could write that this artist is a $15 artist, okay? So that way there's no red flags. The other way is... The promoter, I, I mean the agent, I can write a contract between the artist and that agent. I would call that a sub-agent. So it's almost like they're buying the gig. But then what they're going to do is they're going to draw a contract that goes from them to the promoter. And that will be a little bit more. So as long as I get what the artist is asking for, you know, that's fine, whatever they do. And that's no, usually... The idea. Um, so yeah, we encourage people to to um, to book other agents. I get it all the time. I get agents that call me all the time. Also, want to be agents that call me that are basically just middlemen. They know me and they know a promoter, and they're like, hey, they'll tell the promoter, hey man, I could get little Susie, I could get the cover girls, or I can get anybody. And even if it's not my exclusive acts. They'll still come to me. We'll work out a deal. A lot of times I'll call the artist. I'll let them know. I'll say, hey, listen. So if the artist is $100, I'll say, um, I'm going to sell it to this guy. I'm going to put in a contract for $150. This guy's going to get the $50, and I'm still going to get my $10 commission from you. So that's usually how that works out. Um, and that's usually that's called the buy and sell. All right, so they're buying it from me at my price and reselling it, okay? Um, sometimes if it's a high price artist, if the artist is, let's say 20, 30 or more, at least at least 20,000, um, then it's okay for a couple of agents to share that commission because that if it's at 10%, which is the normal fee, there are some agents that charge 15, I don't agree with that, I just, that's not, that's not typical. So I gotta go with the typical I don't know why any artist would, would want to even uh, pay that, but whatever, to each his own. Um, 
Uh, I can see if it's your exclusive act, like my acts pay more than 10% because I manage them as well and road manage. So it's a different, it's a different, uh, different deal we got going on. Uh, but for a typical, just a straight up booking agent, it shouldn't be more than 10%, to be honest. Um, <coughs> um, but that's one way. But if it's a big artist, that's like 20,000, 30,000, those commissions are two or $3,000. At that point, um, it's cool. We can split two grand. I could walk away with a G, especially if I didn't have to do much. If the other guy's actually doing all the work, it's his client. Eh, it's basically free money, you know? I do the contract. I just make sure that my artist is getting everything that they want. So as long as they got their money, it doesn't affect them. We're good to go. So, um, so that's usually how that works. It's pretty cut and dry it, it um there's you know there's different with different ways sometimes uh the agent will also work out a deal with the buyer with their promoter where their promoter is paying them so their promoter might say you know i'll give you whatever thousand dollars to help me out you know um so i'll get that sometimes sometimes i'll ask a promoter so let's say i mean i'll ask an agent so let's say an agent calls me and they say hey i want the cover girls and I say, okay, cool. They're a hundred dollars. And then I, I say, are you? But you're gonna have to add your money on top. So, which means that he's not gonna get a commission from that hundred, and leave my group with ninety. And then I have to take my money, which will bring my my act down to eighty. So what they say is they're gonna add on top. So. If it's 100 and he wants his 10%, he'll charge 110. But in those situations, I basically give them the freedom. If it's not my client, they have the freedom to charge whatever they want. If they want to double up on the price and they could get that money, that's on them. That's on them. I hope I don't encourage it. I hope they don't get caught doing that. Um, I don't want to be involved with it. I don't want to lie about it because if anybody, if that promoter knows somebody else that has booked directly with me and they get the real deal price it's gonna look bad for somebody so i don't want my hands in that mess but it does happen it does happen i just gotta make sure that my artists are getting whatever they get and it's just like if someone buys a watch from you and they stay by the watch from you for 100 bucks and they went go and they resell the watch for 300 you know what are you gonna say <laughs> you know you you know that was on them. There was nothing you could do. So and if the other person was willing to pay it, hey, well, what you gonna do? You know. So anyway, so that's pretty much how that business rolls. And uh, I've been um, I've been operating as a booking agent for quite some time. In in fact, I think I mentioned this before. Uh, LinkedIn just acknowledged 29 years in business. So I got a little congratulations from the LinkedIn community. Let me sip my my tea. I spilled this shit on my leg before and it burnt me. I wonder if I could sue. Angel made it for me. We'll have to work out a deal. We'll have to settle out. Settle out of court, you know? Anyway... Um, yeah, when I started, the reason why I started booking, um, was I just had the connections, uh, back then I was with Lil Susie Oni, traveling all over the country. I had a really good relationship I would get with these promoters. I mean, these promoters used to take us out, um, and, um. It was pretty pretty new in my career, you know. I was a pretty new traveler. I was traveling just for a few years. And um, after we would have a successful event, a lot of times the promoters would just do conversation. Hey, la, yo, man, we did good. We did good. So who else do you know? Who else do you have? I'm like, well, I can, you know, I don't have anybody, really. I just have Susie, but I can get you anybody you want, you know? Or they just might come out of the blue and say, Hey, hey, Lars, is there any way you could get me Johnny, yo? So, and I knew all the artists because I went on the road with them. So I met them in, 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 as the years went by. Some of them, it began as I was the shy guy in the background. A lot of these artists don't remember I was in the background. I was there. 
um, until they see pictures. Then they're like, oh, shit, you were there? I was like, yeah, I've been around for a long time. I was just real quiet in the back observing and just doing my job. Um, <clears throat> I didn't start really getting aggressive and really getting in, in people's face until I started booking because I had to deal one-on-one with the acts. But um, uh, so they would come to me and they would say, you know, who else do you have? Or who can you get? Or can you get this artist? Can you get me Stevie? Can you get me Lisa? Can you? And I did. So I would pick up the phone. I was working at Metropolitan at that time. And I would contact their manager or contact them. I would track them down. And I would ask them their price because I didn't know their prices at that point. Right now, I could quote pretty much anybody off the top of my head and who they travel with and so on. And um, I would um, I would ask their price. I would go back to the buyer. Um, and I would set up the whole deal. The only thing is that I wasn't technically operating as an agent. I was technically operating as a matchmaker. In other words, I didn't make any money doing that. All I did was, hey, Stevie, I got a show. You, you want to do a show? Yeah, okay. Hey, Paul, that was the promoter. Um, let me put you in touch with Stevie, and I will put him in touch, you know, until it got to a point where the, where the buyer said, hey, can you, can you, you think you could just handle that? Like, I don't have time to deal with this contracts. I don't have time. And I'm like, okay, all right. And what I did is I took one of our contracts, one of the little Susie contracts. I think it came from Pyramid. It must have come from Pyramid or Famous, one of those agencies from back in the days. And, uh, I basically retyped it. I retyped it, and and I remember because it just said booking contract on top. It had no company name. I had Law Entertainment, but it was a management company, and it was managing like some of the acts on my Style and Free label. And um, but I never used it as a booking agent agency. And so I made this very generic um, contract that had all the lines. So you basically by by hand you filled in the blanks. Um, and then I would send that to the buyer, and the buyer would sign. I would send it to the artist, and they would sign. And I would get the um, the information from the artist as to where to send the check. We were doing checks then. wasn't no wires yet. And the promoter would send the check directly to them, or they would send it to me. And sometimes I would deliver it, because back in those days, we held on to the checks till after the show. So... We got the gig for the artist. The artist went, did the gig, picked up their pickup money before they went on stage. And then when they got back to their home and we knew that everything was good, then we would send them their money minus our commission. But at that point, I wasn't yet taking a commission. This is what was so crazy. I booked dozens of shows. I mean, I must have went like a whole year just with these connections. And, um, and then I got the Lowrider Magazine um, account. And that was a big account. I mean, they were they were buying the Stevie B's and the Lisa Lisa's and the Dougie Freshes. All these people were like, they were expensive. Like, what I was pulling in with these acts was like more than I was making on my job in like a, a whole month. I was pulling this in, in, in like one day. It was crazy. And then, um, but before that, before I got that lowrider gig, I remember booking some act. I forgot who it was. And he just assumed that I took 10%. He says, what do you take? You just take 10%, right? And I don't know. I, I talked fast and I said, yeah. <laughs> and then it dawned on me because I dealt with agents. I dealt with agents. And um, and I think that artist was only like maybe two grand. So it was like $200, but it's like pretty fast $200 to make that, you know? And um, And then at that point, I thought about, I sat down and started to contemplate putting together a legitimate booking agent agency. And I was working at Metropolitan Records at that time, you know? And it was crazy because I had negotiated with the boss for a raise, okay? And he knew that I was already, like, he would hear me on the phone. I would book shows, but I was able to get my job. Nothing ever interfered. And when we negotiated a raise for me, which I always got my raise, I made good money at Metro, um... He would always store him, well, I'll let you use my infrastructure, you know, to book your shows and, you know. But then what was happening is um, is uh, I was getting a lot. I started booking quite a bit, and I used to have the money used to get FedEx to me 
as a check or a, it used to usually be a cashier's check, bank check or money order. And it used to be sent to Metropolitan. And a few times they opened those up by mistake and they saw what they were and they, they were able to do the math and they saw the money I was making because it was constant. I mean, it was like every day. Um, but anyway, when that artist asked me how much I charged and he said, and I said, yeah, yeah, I, I charged 10%. At that point is when I basically turned it into a business. And <clears throat> that's even when I started to charge Susie, where I had rearranged the pricing because at that point I was only on the road with her as a road manager. But when her dad decided to step off, because I used to travel with either her mom or dad. And so I used to handle all the road management work. They were basically just a company because she was young. She was a minor. So at that point, um, when they handed her over to me, um, I basically renegotiated my deal with them and kind of did an all-in price that would cover my bookings, my management, and my road management. So it was pretty significant. Um, going out with her was like, <laughs> paid all the bills, you know? Anything on top of that was like jelly, <laughs> you know? So, and, um, and then from that point, uh, because I was the only agent that was actually on the road, I got to really get on a different level with so many of these uh, promoters. Um, uh, it just became, we became friends. We became friends. And it wasn't me trying to kiss their ass for shows. We just, I got to know them. And, and I always like people. I like good people, you know. Um, if you're cool, I, I want to be cool with you, you know. And it just started to blossom. And then, of course, word of mouth, hey, you need somebody. Matter of fact, that happened today. Has uh, an old promoter who recommended another promoter just to, just an hour ago. Um, and they called me because I always ask, so how did you hear about me? Because I get a calls every every day that just come out of the blue. And I always ask. So a lot of times they oh, I went on little Susie's page. I went on the Cover Girls page. Or I Googled freestyle artists, whatever the case. Uh, or somebody told me about you. And um, and I'll get the gigs that way. So, um, so I was very, really able to um, set up a really great network of people around me. So it was, it was really cool. Um, and then, and this was before social media, mind you. And I used to do a lot of internet marketing. I used to do, anybody who knows me from back in the days, I had the freestyle, the, um, the style of free uh, message board. I had, um, I was always busy. I always had stuff going on. And, um, I used to do this mailing list through, uh, through one of the companies, through the mailing companies. And I had built my mailing list to like 97,000 people. And I got most of that list, a good chunk of that list, from the Winter Music Conference. Not, not a good chunk because I think the conference was only like 4,500 people. But over the years, I, um, um, I built this massive, massive mailing list. Uh, and I used my message board to do that. Um, and then I was the only one that was putting together these email blasts, these e-blasts. And I used to call it Freestyle Blast. I don't know if any of you guys remember that. And I used to shoot them out like almost every day. And I used to promote this artist, promote that artist, promote this show, promote this one, you know, promote packages. And the calls would come in. The calls would come in. And um, then when social media kicked in, I was one of the first people that was really kind of dabbling. I was already, I already knew the ins and outs of Facebook, even MySpace before that. One of the first people I knew that did Twitter. So I used to use that and I used to put my rosters on there and ship them out and get them out to people. And I used to get a lot. I remember I used to spam people. I was spamming people all the time. I remember, you know, artists telling me, you know, make it, it was like a joke. They say, yeah, man, I'm, I get your email like 10 times a day, <laughs> you know, but because I had everybody in the mail list. I had artists, producers, promoters, club owners, you know, executives. I had so many people on that mailing list, but it worked. It really did its job. Then later on, you know, people, as the years went by, started losing their email and start shrinking. And finally, the company called me because there was a lot of dormant um, dormant uh, emails on there that were just dead. And they forced me to get rid of them. And uh, so the numbers, uh, the mailing list dropped significantly. You know, so right now, um, I'm trying to rebuild it, but it's good that they got rid of it because the last thing you want to do is market to a bunch of dead emails. So you need to clean that out and just start from scratch, man. Just start all over again. But, um, 
but that's pretty much how I got into the whole booking game. Uh, and I mean, there was a time that everything came to me, like everything. Uh, and then when social media came in, at first I thought it was um, a blessing for the job. And, and it still is. So I'm not going to say it's not. But it did change everything. It did put everything into another gear. It shifted the entire way of doing business. So, um, and once people learn how to use social media, uh, that was it. That was it. And then what, what it did, it made a lot of the artists accessible. So they were a lot more accessible. See, before there was no way for them to reach out to the artist except through an agent. So I was, I made sure I was in that position. But um, once social media came out and artists started putting their phone numbers and their information and promoting the fact that you could call them direct, then it kind of made everything slow down. It kind of took the agency and kind of moved it a little bit, you know, which is why I focus a lot more on my girls. If other show, if shows come in for other acts, I service them. I service acts every week. Um, but I don't promote them like I used to because what I noticed is a lot of times I would promote um, acts and everybody's still the same. It's, it's you know, nothing to be mad about. It's just the way businesses, you know, promote. Artists have to pay a commission and sometimes they prefer not to pay the commission. I don't think it's really a wise decision on their part, but to each his own. Um, if they want to save the 10%, they'll save the 10%. Not a big deal. The only thing is that they miss out on is they have to rely on their own promotions. They don't rely on the stuff that I know and my constant, constant, you know, bashing these people over the head, spamming them with the information. So, um, but I think it was for the best because I pulled back, cleaning up my list now. I got the girls on there. We're expanding. We're doing other things. So it, it's cool. It, everything happens for a reason. And um, I couldn't just keep on doing what I was doing. So that had to shift. That had to change. So that way I could change and start going in a different path. Still freestyle. Still bookings. Nothing like that has changed. But what I'm doing is taking what I do and expanding it into other areas that still relate to what I do for a living. You know? So, um, but yeah, so... And that was pretty much it. It was, uh, uh, yeah, I loved doing the bookings. Uh, I think I was really good at it. I got a lot of props. I think every artist out there has given me props on bookings. Um, but like I said, you know, they get to save 10%. So a lot of them start taking the shows themselves. And um, I couldn't get mad. I think it was for the best because had I just continued to be successful doing it, uh, there's a good chance I would not have moved. I would not have even attempted to do something else. You know, that happened the same thing when I worked at Metropolitan. The only reason I was scared to leave that job was I was scared of the benefits, you know, losing the benefits. And meanwhile, before that, I had no damn benefits. I was always an entrepreneur. All of a sudden, I get with this, with this company, a stable, so-called stable company where I could get dental and medical and, and insurance and 401k and all this grown-up shit, <laughs> you know. Then, and I only had that for a short period of time compared to the amount of time that I didn't have it. So when you know you're going to lose it or you lose it, you kind of kind of lose your mind a bit. You're like, oh, you start thinking, oh, what a, so if this happens, what's going what's gonna to happen here? What's going to happen here? So it's crazy. You start, you start thinking like that, you know. So, um, uh, you know, you know I, mean, I mean, what you going to do? You know, so. But anyway, uh, I just want to... Uh, to reach out to you guys tonight. I really appreciate everything. If you guys have any questions, man, find a way of getting in touch with me. I'm up in the air whether to create um, a Facebook page to control this to um, for the podcast or um, should I just keep it on the Latif Mercado page? I don't know. I'm up in the air right now. So uh, I'll think about it. I'll think about it. You know, it's just managing another page, but it might make sense. So we'll see. We'll see how that works out. But okay, guys, um, I appreciate you so much. Thank you. Please, if you haven't watched, listen to all the podcasts, go back to number one and listen. Remember, I'm doing this every single day. Um, and then I do it every, well, it's really every evening. And I post it before midnight. So I try to go between 10 p.m. Um, between 10 p.m. and midnight, where is when I uh, I like to post it 
on Anchor. It's also available on Spotify and um, I think Outcast and Breaker. So pretty much all of the podcast platforms. So if you have one or two that you're, you're accustomed to using, that you like to use, you can find us there. Just go Good Night Freestyle and it should be there. And if you do find it or you're listening it to somewhere else besides Anchor, let me know. <coughs> um, Anchor's a great program. It's new. It's very easy. You can put it on your phone. Um, very simple. Um, I like it. It's just a new program, new platform. So uh, what else? Also, if um, the following day, I always take this podcast and put it on my YouTube channel, which is at Latif Mercado. Okay, so go to YouTube and type in my name and you'll see it's under uh, Good Night Freestyle. That's the playlist. And you can again, you can binge watch all of those episodes. What I do need you guys to do, though, if you go on there, is I need three things from you. First of all, I'm not even going to mention comments because comments are, are given. I always need comments. I need you guys to give me it. Maybe help me with some ideas on what to what to um what, what, what to talk about, if there's any questions you guys have that I can answer. Um, you know, I want this to be of value. I don't want this to just be me, a talking head. If there's something that I can say that can, you know, maybe put you on a different path or help, you know, strike up some new ideas and put you on, you know, let me know, please. I would love to do that. So I don't, I don't, don't hesitate at all. Also, um, if you can always please like these videos. So when you see them and you like them, that's cool. That really helps us out a lot. Um, and of course, subscribe. If you subscribe, that looks great. Um, and then if you subscribe, you can also click the notification bell. And what this does is this will let you know every time I upload a new uh, podcast. So that's cool. You'll be able to um, to really uh, uh, juice that one. And you know, what's good beauty about the podcast is you can listen to it anywhere, man. You can lay down, close your eyes. I'm Listen to it. Put your headphones on. You can listen to it when you're driving, when you're working out in the gym, when you're cooking, when you're cleaning, when you're doing laundry, walking the dog, riding your bike. I mean, it's endless. A podcast is dope. You can take it with you anywhere. And this is what I want. You know, I want you guys to pick this up and I want you guys to to, to listen in and you know, build with me, man. Build with me. There's a community here. I'm, I'm, I'm slowly but surely getting to that topic. But right now, I'm trying to build us a nice uh, groundwork and trying to make us, you know, comfortable with one another. And then we'll, you know, we'll be able to expand and just move into other things. But that's it for now. Remember, comment, like, share on the YouTube versions. Um, if you give me the stars, I think you can. You can vote me in on all the platforms, whatever platform you're using, Spotify or um, or Anchor. Just uh, give me props on it. That always helps. So, okay, folks, thank you so much, and good night, freestyle. Before I lay me down to sleep, I pray to hear a freestyle beat. For if I die before I wake, I hope to make it to the break.